Now, before I continue, the stories I'm going to recite might not have occurred exactly how I described them, since both of the stories I'm going to tell happened when I was pretty young. Nevertheless, here are two stories that didn't happen to me, but happened to both my grandmother and my sister. Back in 2006, my granddad passed away, and at the time, I would have been four. But as someone who has a terrible memory, I can still remember him pretty well. When he passed away, it hit everyone pretty hard, and my nan, for the first time in her life, now lived by herself. My nan used to have a queen-sized bed, which essentially had a bedside table connected to it as well, as a headrest which was big enough to hold pictures and small ornaments. So basically, it was pretty big. On the two bedside tables, there were two huge lamps which turned on and off whenever you touched the lamp itself. It didn't have a switch. One night, not too long after my granddad passed away, my nan was just laying in bed when the lamp next to where my granddad would sleep lit up and then turned off. She brushed it off as something possibly leaning against the lamp, but then it happened again, so she was understandably pretty spooked. She decided to ask if it was my granddad and the lamp turned on. My nan began to cry and began to say various different things, and she was getting a response as the lamp turned on and off. She recorded it happening, but considering it was 2006, and I'm unsure what she even recorded it on, I've never seen the footage, but both my mum and nan both said that it exists. As a sceptic, when it comes to the paranormal, I hope that it would possibly make me a believer. Around 2011, my gran passed away, and at the time, she was not in a position, both physically and financially, to live on her own. So she lived with my dad right up until she passed away. My parents split when I was really young, so when we would go to see him, I would sleep in his room, which was pretty big. Big enough for an extra bed, and my sister slept in another room. But when my gran passed, my older sister slept in her room from then on. One day, she opened the door to go to sleep, only to find my gran sitting on the edge of the bed. I clearly remember her running into my dad's room in tears, screaming, saying that she saw my gran. I remember my dad trying to calm her down, and when he went into the room himself but saw nothing. My sister was terrified of going back there, and subsequently didn't spend weekends with my dad for a very long time. I'm both grateful, but also pretty annoyed that I never encountered anything like this. It probably really shit me up. I'm the sort of person who hates horror films, so I'd rather not have an experience like this, but then again, I always brush off stories, but I myself have never experienced anything relatable in any way. I'm currently 18, and have been living in my house for I'd say about 8 years now. My family, which included at the time my two sisters and my mother, moved in with my nana because of a few reasons I wouldn't want to bore you with. But for the first 10 years of my life, we lived in a house where so many unexplained things happened. Even since we moved, a few horrible things have happened there, which I won't go into detail about, possibly later. Firstly, this was before I was born and when I was a newborn. My elder sister, who was three when I was born, had a friend who she played with in the house. She described her as skinny, blonde hair, and she distinctively remembers her having a mole on her left cheek. My sister is also blonde, so when my mother saw a young blonde girl dash past her doorway, she would assume it was my sister. Only until she realised that my sister was in the same room as her. My sister would blabber on about her friend to my mother quite frequently, saying how much she liked to play with her. Another time, my mother was asleep on the couch. She said it was around 9 or 10 at night, when she awoke suddenly, a man she'd never seen before screaming her name in her face. She still says it was the most terrified she's ever been, and had called the police as well as my dad, who was at work at the time, to come home. The house was searched, but no signs of anyone. There were even times where my mother would lose her keys or phone or whatever, check somewhere, for example, the kitchen side, and they wouldn't be there. She'd go look somewhere else and then come back into the kitchen to find whatever she was looking for sat in a place she'd already searched. In my own experience at that house, I'd hear tapping on the walls, footsteps, but I am a person who thinks rationally and logically, so I pass these off. Yeah, I can't explain my personal experiences, but I'm not as clueless as to immediately say that it was something paranormal. A few years back, however, my mother got a message on Facebook from the people who moved in after we left 
asking if anything weird happened there when we lived at the house. So some weird stuff must have happened to them too. It's pretty depressing because everyone in my family has some memory of something strange happening at the old house apart from me. Well, if you don't count the tapping and footsteps, etc. But being in the house did feel unsettling and even though the idea of cold spots in a haunted place is a bit of a cliche, there would be times where you just suddenly feel cold. Back when I was a kid, I had an imaginary friend named Charlie. From what I remember, Charlie was around from the time I was about four years old up until I was nine, when my family moved to a different house. So I spent five years talking and playing with Charlie. My parents encouraged it because I didn't have any real friends or siblings, and it wasn't uncommon for a lonely kid to create an imaginary friend to play with. I was a loner, and still very much am today. Charlie told me he used to live in my house before my family moved in. I believed him because we often played hide and seek and he knew all of the best hiding spots. He knew things about the house that even I didn't know at the time. A couple of times I asked him where his parents were and why they didn't live in the house with him and he never gave me an answer. After a year or so, he started asking me to do strange things like stealing change from my mom's purse or hiding my dad's car keys so he would be late to work. Random, mischievous stuff like that. When I refused, his requests became much more sinister, telling me to push my mom down the stairs, start a fire in my parents' bedroom, etc. Of course, I again refused. Charlie became more cold, and instead of wanting to play, he only suggested doing things to hurt me or my parents. I was scared of him. I never told my parents what he said, only that I didn't want to play with him anymore. When we moved out of that house, I didn't bring Charlie with me. I forgot about him for many years, until a few days ago when my mother asked me if I remembered having an imaginary friend growing up. That's when all of this started to come back to me. I did some research into the history of my old house and found that there was indeed a young boy named Charlie whose family lived in the house about 15 years before mine and apparently died at a young age. But I couldn't find any info as to how or where he died. Is it a coincidence that my creepy imaginary friend and the kid who died in my house shared the same name? Why was he telling me to hurt my parents? Did I imagine him or was he a ghost? I never know for sure, but feel free to share your opinions. I had some crazy experiences when my family and I moved into our new house when I was 8 years old. The first time I noticed something wrong was a day when I was playing with my new RC car. I played with it in the living room for a few minutes, then took a break to use the computer. I left the controller on with the toy car behind me. I then started hearing an odd sound that was happening in bursts, and it sounded like a small power tool coming from beneath the house. I sat there confused looking around, but it stopped. A few minutes later, I heard it again. I turned around and noticed that the long antenna on the RC car was wiggling back and forth. The sound was the car moving by itself. Then there was a time not too long after that, I had another odd experience, and the thought of this one still makes me uncomfortable. One day, I was in the family room watching TV and there was a computer swivel chair to my slight left in the room. Suddenly, the chair slowly turned and faced me, and it wasn't like the chair had slightly turned, it made a good, decent sized turn. What's even more odd is that that room is known for having an uneven surface, whereas the floor is at a slight slant. The chair swiveled up against the slant towards me. A few months went by and there was a day when I had family come over and visit. It was at night and my family was in the family room across the house. I was watching TV with my brother in his room with the TV to my left and the doorway to the hall in front of me from where I sat. He told me he was going to go hang out with the family and I told him I would join as soon as the episode finished. He leaves and I enjoy my time, but a few minutes go by and I start noticing something. The doorway is in front of me and it's dark with no light. And when I look at the TV, I can see the doorway from the corner of my eye. As I'm watching TV, I seem to notice a human-like figure standing in the dark doorway. I immediately turned my head and saw nothing there, and I figure it's just my eyes playing tricks on me. 
I go back to looking at the TV and suddenly I see this figure again, but this time I wait slightly longer before turning to directly look at it. I noticed it was shaped like a woman who was wearing a dress, but no details other than a white shape. I look and it disappears. And at this point I'm kind of freaking out, but I'm trying to convince myself it's not real. I turn to face the TV once more and the figure reappears, but this time it's moving. Her hands and arms making shapes to make some gestures. After that, I bolted out of the room and ran to my family. After that experience, I still wasn't 100% sure if what I saw was real, and a few weeks went by. One night I was hanging out with my sister in her room. Out the doorway of her room, you can see the doorway into my room on the immediate right. We were talking and joking around, until something caught my eye. There was a shadow of what seemed to look like the bottom of a dress on the floor in my room, with the rest of the figure being hidden by the edge of the doorway. It looked like the bottom of the window curtain swaying slightly in the wind. Then it moved up and out of view around the corner to the doorway. I immediately went into my room to check and it was empty. I heard no curtains nor anything fabric that could cause that shadow. I went back to my sister's room and told her what I saw. She didn't really take it seriously and brushed over the topic. Soon after, she looked at me concerned and told me, Man, you really did see something, huh? She said that my face was extremely pale. Finally, about a year goes by. One morning I awoke. I opened my bedroom door and my sister came up to me with deep concern on her face. I asked her what's wrong and she begins to tell me the story of what happened overnight while I was sleeping. She tells me that in the middle of the night, she heard what sounded like our mom outside in the hallway, softly calling out my name, James. My sister found this unusual and called my mom via cell phone to ask if it was her. My mom awoke with a groggy voice saying it wasn't her and that she's asleep in her room. My sister got freaked out and went to my mom's room where she slept for the rest of the night. Later on in the same night, my grandmother and grandfather, who live in the back house, went to my mom's room and woke up my mom and sister. They said that they heard a woman crying and screaming in the backyard. After hearing that story, it was like it confirmed everything that I had experienced. Mind you, that I kept most of those experiences to myself and didn't share them much. That was the end of it for a while. Never heard or saw anything for years. But there was one last experience. It was 2011 and I was all grown up now, still living in my mom's house. One morning, I woke up and went to the living room and began opening the blinds on the window to let the light in. As I'm opening the blinds, I hear my mom calling out for me across the house. I told her to give me a second as I finished opening the blinds. I walk to the family room where I heard her and she's not there. I assume she went back into her room and checked. She's not there. I then checked my grandparents' house. She or there are there. I went back to the living room and looked out the window and realised that all my family's cars were gone. I was home alone. I called my mom to further confirm she wasn't home and she indeed was not. The voice I heard call my name was as clear as day, didn't even question it in the slightest. That was the last time I came into contact with what seemed to be a woman who had interest in me. I'm not a religious man, rather I'm a man of science and reasoning always trying to pick out possibilities before jumping to conclusions. But everything I had experienced leaves me puzzled. Everything actually happened, and even if I have trouble believing it sometimes, it's overwhelming. It was July 19th, 2016. I remember the date because we had our annual Christmas in July at my in-laws, and it was a crazy full moon. We had left to head home, we took the back way, we live in a somewhat rural area, so the back way is very dark, no traffic at that time of night, and the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour. As we're driving along, and about 5 minutes from home, out of the corner of my eye towards the forest on the passenger side, I catch a glimpse of something moving fast. The moment my foot hits the brake, my wife's hand grabs my leg, getting goosebumps as I tight this. It was such a crazy experience. We come to a screeching halt in the road, and whatever it was stopped dead in front of us. It cocked its head to look at us. We both at the same time said, do you see that? It was huge. Best guess, 
seven foot tall. It had yellow eyes that glowed from the headlights. And it was muscular and skinny at the same time. The most memorable feature though were its legs. It 100% looked like a dog walking upright with the cocked angle in its leg. No sooner did it stop and glare at us did it continue to bolt across the road and vanish into the forest on my driver's side. The only way we've ever been able to describe it was werewolf-like. And like I said, my wife and I both agreed. If we had not both witnessed it, I'd have called myself crazy and never mentioned it. But we both saw it. No question about it. Ghost? Werewolf? No idea, but whatever it was was huge, mean-looking, and fast. I've told this to family and friends, and I'm always given a sceptical look, or it brings chills to their spine. It sounds far-fetched, but honestly, it was as real as it can get for me, and that's all that matters. I was around 10 or 11 at the time, and was in my old home in Millmont, Pennsylvania. It was after school, and I spent a few hours just gaming in the first full living room. It was only me and my older brother home at the time, since my parents worked second shift until around 11pm. It was around 7 or 8pm when I began to crave one of my favourite snacks. I walked in the kitchen and opened some blueberry pop-tarts and sat down at the kitchen table. I was facing away from the living room at the end table. Now I need to explain the layout so you better understand. Before entering the kitchen, there's a small archway with no door. It leads straight from the kitchen to the living room, extending to around two feet of open space on either side, after the archway. From the living room continuing straight, there's a staircase to the left, facing away from the kitchen view. I was mid-bite of my pop-tarts when all of a sudden, I began feeling what I can only describe as dread mixed with the feeling of being watched. I kind of shook it off because of it being so random. It made no sense as to why I felt that way, so I just kept eating. It was a few more small bites in when the feeling intensified and I only had a gut instinct to turn around. I decided to do so when I shouldn't have. I'm going to try my best to describe the finite details of what I saw. When I turned around, I was immediately focused on the three quarters of a face peeking out, completely sideways on the right side of the archway. Now this face was completely solid and not transparent at the least. It was the face of my older brother Jonathan. His eyes were opened wide, unblinking, and staring directly into my own. His face had an absolutely sinister smile. An ear-to-ear -ear smile that was almost too far stretched out to be normal. My brother's skin was normally pale, but this face was an extremely pale, being for sure a few shades lighter, almost like a slightly cream porcelain. The face's eyes were the same colour as John being bright blue, but it seemed almost glossy. It made no s noise and never attempted to speak. It just stared at me, unmoving. Now I have a condition where I get heart palpitations from a murmur I've had since birth. If I'm surprised or get excited too quickly, I get several quick palpitations. I've had it for as long as I remember. When I suddenly saw that face, I had to clutch my chest as an immense immediate fear and surprise caused my heart to palpitate several times. I also got a huge lump in my throat. I couldn't scream or yell. I just stared widely back in a paralyzed terror. What was around five seconds felt more like an eternity. The face then pulled back behind the archway at an angle you wouldn't think possible. For a few seconds I was terrified, but then I just began to trying to rationally think of what I saw, in an attempt to pull myself back to earth. In my own mind, I knew it was my brother. It's just his features were a bit oblong and that smile was more sinister than anything I've seen before. I was already used to him pranking me on a weekly basis, so I convinced myself that it was another one of his stupid pranks. I thought to myself that I can also sneak to the archway myself and scare him back since he didn't walk back to the living room. I knew he was just hiding on the right side of the archway, so I slowly and silently got up from the chair and sneaked my way to the right side of the archway from the kitchen. I reached the edge of it, waited a few seconds and then jumped out and yelled BOO! However, to my confusion, there was nothing there. There was no way that my brother could have moved away from that position without me seeing, as that part of the wall only came out about two feet. 
I still had visible access to the rest of the living room from the kitchen. I was in shock and confusion when all of a sudden I heard a quick walk coming from the staircase on the left side of the living room. I slowly turned towards the staircase and looked up at the sight of my older brother, looking back at me with a confused expression. Dude, who the hell are you yelling at? My brother said as he peeked over the stairwell at me. He was 13 at the time. I was just in utter shock. I tried to make out words, but I just couldn't. My lip was only quivering. I instead turned back around, went back into the kitchen and sat down at the kitchen table again, just staring into my Pop-Tarts for about a minute or two. My brother came down the stairs and into the kitchen and saw the blank look on my face and pressed on his question. I told him everything I saw and he somehow believed me. Maybe due to the fear and panic I had when he first saw my face. I was researching online what I could have possibly seen, and I've only been pointed to what is known as a doppelganger, but I saw that they were an exact copy of a living person. That thing was very close to being exact, but wasn't 100%. I'd say 90% at best, with that stretched smile and the skin tone. Also, my research showed me that they're not sinister or evil, but can be a sign of bad luck. But I swear, the only feeling I got off of it was dread and a sense of sinister evil. I never saw it again after that day. So what exactly was it then? I have no idea. I have other experiences from my 27 years of life. But that was the scariest out of them all. And I just wanted to see if anyone has any idea what I witnessed. When I was 11 or 12, my family moved to a house in some woods, pretty close to the town. It was a lodge, a wooden house. My two brothers, sister and dad. My mum was in another, similar house next to ours, as there wasn't enough space. In the first few days, it seemed good, safe, and even freer than usual. My dad worked in the evenings, so we'd be alone in our room doing homework, chatting, normal stuff. One evening, my dad was going to stay till morning... So me and my brother got his room. We were in bed trying to sleep. It was about 2am when I heard footsteps next to the bedroom and thought it was my sister. So I yelled, go to sleep, Sarah. No response. The footsteps got closer to the door and it slowly opened. There was no one there. Then I heard footsteps next to the bed. I wasn't scared. I felt safe. I felt like whatever that was was just checking up on me to see if I was okay. Footsteps stopped and the door closed. I fell asleep with a smile. I felt safer than ever. My dad came in the morning and I was already awake watching TV on the couch. My dad asked me, did mom check up on you during the night as I told her? And I found it to be a strange opportunity. I answered, no, someone else did. My dad was confused, so he asked me who it was. And I said I didn't know. We had a short laugh. The next night, everything over again. Dad stayed at work until morning. This time, I'd purposely stayed up to repeat like last night. I heard a loud bang on the other side of the wall to my left. I screamed, and that woke my brother up. Josh? What the hell just banged so fucking loud? I don't know. Let's check. I was excited. Josh, are you sane? It's two in the morning. I know, but I really want to know what it was. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go first in case someone breaks in. He grabbed a random broom from next to the door and we went there. There was nothing there and everything was in place. I heard footsteps coming towards dad's room's door. Wait, I yelled, knowing my brother heard it too. Josh, who are you talking to? I don't know, but I hear footsteps coming to our room, like last night. Whatever it was was next to me, checking up on me. Are you sane, really? No, no, I believe you but there's a certainly a ghost in here or something. We rushed to the room and went to bed. I suddenly felt unsafe, really endangered. I felt like a sniper scope watched me. It felt so wrong. I felt safe the last time, right? The feeling of fright went through my body and suddenly a smell of blood, like something had just died. I fell asleep if someone had just strangled me. I woke up in the morning and went to make a sandwich as I was starving. I saw something run to the kitchen before me and hear a thump as if someone fell. Sarah? Mike? Ian? 
Dad? Who's there? Are you okay? Then I stopped. No one was there. I heard the breathing of about five people around me. I turned to say the names of my family. My dad walks in. You called, bud? You need something? No, dad. Is mom here? No, she's over at her house. Okay, um... Then I told him what was happening. He said he believed me, so we sold the houses and moved. Since then, I felt safe. I prayed every morning for three years. I was terrified. Now I'm 21 years old, and I still talk with Sarah and Ian. Not Mike. He died in a house fire. About that whenever we meet. I used to live in Libya, in Tripoli to be exact. Libya is a really rural country, but I lived in the city, which is like the suburbs in America. My mom's aunt lived in the street next to us. I always went there with my sisters to play with my mom's cousin's children. There were three girls, 12, 11, two years old at that time. I was 10 and my sisters were younger than me. I remember we were playing hide and seek. When we were about to start, the oldest of the girls just stopped talking. She looked at us and said hide, but not as in the game, but in real life. She said we have to all hide together. It was just me, my sister and her and her younger sister. We hid behind a car and said we have to peek at the rest of the streets. We all looked and then out of nowhere, the whole area we were in was empty with no people or cars. To be honest, it always didn't have a lot of people, but at that time of day, which was the evening, it should have had a few people in cars, but there wasn't any. We waited for a minute and she said we had to make no sound. And then a yellow Canaro came and started doing donuts. I know this might sound kind of weird and to make it even weirder in Libya, we don't have expensive cars. And a Camaro was really rare to see. After that, I remember me and my sister running home scared and told our parents, but they didn't think it was weird or anything. What made me scared was how the girls I was playing with, especially the oldest, was acting. She was looking at the car and was waiting for it like she knew it was going to happen. Now, the thing that made me post this and made me remember it was that she, the eldest, died yesterday because of a car accident. A yellow Camaro hit her and killed her and the car ran away. My sister and I remembered the story and we're really spooked right now. I'm 16 years old right now. If this has any importance, magic was and still is somewhat popular in Libya, especially in family fights with other families and love spells. So to start the story off, my mother was Catholic and my dad who knows at the time of this story. He never really talked about it. So when this occurred, we lived in Spring, Texas. I was three years old. Weirdly enough, I remember life back to when I was around two. So we moved here when I was one, from Iowa. My dad got a new job and we had some family down the street. So let me start with details on the house layout, so you can imagine it's somewhat better. It was a blue square looking house, which was quite poor looking. Old paint, old wood, etc. You walk into the front door, you're in the living room. To the right was a straight shot to the back door, past my room, and my mom dad's room. My room had a door that connected the two rooms also. By the back door was the washer, and an open attic where you can look up into the attic back there. Okay, now that I explain the layout. When I was three, I remember I was going outside sometime in the morning, and I looked up on the way out the back door. I saw a kid, about five I would say. He just had his legs hanging off the ledge in the attic by the back door. We made eye contact and I remember not being scared, but I was also like, who is that? Weird. And just ran out the back door. Moving on to the next, my room freaked me out. When my mom read books to me, I would fall asleep and she would just head to her room through the connecting door. The night I had the worst feeling, my blanket was pulled down. I remember waking up in the pitch black looking down and then right when I looked down, it ripped my whole blanket off of me. I still to this day can feel the fear I felt as a child. I screamed so loud with my heart racing, jumped straight out of bed and went to the connecting door to my mom's room, freaking the hell out. 
When I brought this up to her and she said she didn't know I had that happen, saying I was just crying and panicking until I passed out asleep. So, when starting this conversation, she told me she didn't believe in spirits until that house. She told me about nights of my dad was working. He did overnight work. She would hear someone walking through the wooden kitchen clear as day, telling me that she understood that it's old and houses creak, right? But the part that makes us weirder, the back door would get opened. Easy explanation since the house was old, but the door had two dead bolts and one chain lock with the door handle locked. And while alone, my mom was worried about people breaking in. She would lock all of them. And every night, all unlocked and open. And she wouldn't leave the room until it was quiet. She ended up telling my dad, but he didn't believe her until a night he was off work and it happened. He said to my mom, do you hear that? Someone's in the house walking through the kitchen. And she just said, that's what I told you has been happening. He grabbed a bat and ran opening their door so that you could see the kitchen and back door. No one was there. The door was still locked. I was told he looked through the whole house, checking locks and windows. No one was there. When they went to sleep and woke up, the back door was wide open, all locks off. Nothing stolen, nothing in different places. This is where my parents started getting worried. After this experience, she said with the door still opening, she was watching TV in the middle of the day. She heard the walking and she looked into the kitchen and said she knew it was walking her way. When the noise stopped, she sighed, but she freaked out when an indention of someone sitting on the cushion right next to her. When she jumped up the spot and stayed until she ran by it, then when she looked back, the cushion was slowly raising back up. She said she called a priest to bless the house that day and said I stopped screaming, but still said I did not want to sleep in that room and that the door and walking stopped after that. My parents built their house in 1974, in a very small, very old subdivision in upstate New York. Next door is a three-level, three-family home that was built long before theirs, sometime in the late 1800s. This past fall, my son and I were raking leaves on an unusually warm Saturday afternoon. I enjoyed telling my son about all the trees that are still up and how my friends and I used to use them as bases when playing wiffle ball or kickball back there. My parents don't have acreage, but they do have a pretty sizable backyard. While clearing an area by a tree found close to the back corner of the yard, I came across what appeared to be a small broom. It was severely rusted and seemed to literally be coming out of the tree, as the tree seems to be shedding some of its bark. It was very strange. I couldn't believe that it was there for a long time. Someone would have seen it somehow. Anyway, I picked it up and started feeling the bristles. They literally fell out as strings of dirt and just became a part of the ground at that point. We took the remnants of it inside to show my mom. She and my dad, who passed away nearly 10 years ago, used to live in that house next door when my grandparents owned it. During that time, she said that the Wheelers, a family living in the first floor of the house at the time, used to work on cars in that exact same spot before they built the house and put a fence up and so forth. We chatted for a while, threw the old broom away and finished raking the yard. Ever since that day, my two to three year old golden doodle literally sprints, beeline, like there's a squirrel there, back to that same exact spot as soon as we get into my mom's house, barks when she gets behind the tree, stops abruptly, wags her tail uncontrollably, and then nonchalantly strolls through the yard to find a stick, do her business, or whatever it is she feels like doing. It never happened prior to that day, and now we just laugh because it's her thing to do when we get there. I grew up in a house that was over 100 years old when we moved in. For years, I never experienced anything remotely paranormal. But when I was 13, I moved into the basement. On the first night, I didn't sleep. This isn't uncommon because I'm an insomniac, but this was different. My room was pitch black at night because the only window was tiny. 
I rolled over in the night and heard my inflatable chair. Hey, it was the early 2000s. Move. As if someone was getting out of it. I felt that someone was standing behind me, watching me, and the feeling didn't abate until I started to see the sunrise. I lived in that basement for seven more years and had a myriad of other experiences. I heard a man and woman arguing in the laundry room when nobody else was home. I'd set three alarms. Again, I'm an insomniac. And all three would be turned off in the morning. I'd hear whispers in my ear when I was laying on the couch trying to nap. I saw a shadow figure going up and down the back stairs, which led to the basement. But the creepiest experience happened when I was 14. If you hadn't leaned it yet, I have trouble sleeping. And this is mostly because I'm a light sleeper. Literally anything will wake me up. One night, my friends and I were having a sleepover in our basement living room. My two friends and my sister slept together on our fold-out couch. I slept on the recliner, which was in front of my bedroom door. When we woke up in the morning, we found that my friend Kristen, who'd been sleeping in the middle of the other two, was gone. My parents were still asleep, and we didn't want to wake them, so we searched the house ourselves. All of her stuff was still there. When we didn't find her, I decided to go into my room and call her parents. I moved the recliner, which was still in front of my bedroom door, propped up against it with no wiggle room. There was no other way into my room. I opened the door and there was Kristen, asleep in my bed. She had no memory of getting up in the night and she wasn't a sleepwalker. People have tried to tell me that she must have gone past me, but that's impossible. I would have woken up if she'd even walked past me, let alone if she moved the recliner I was in to open the door. My sister and I still get chills when we talk about it. Cutting to the chase. In October, we lost our dog of 13 years. Her name was Bella. And no, I didn't name her after Twilight, though it was in vogue at the time. As a two-month-old puppy, she witnessed the murder of her then-owner. She was one of six pups. Ironically, her brother was adopted by my parents' neighbour. They'd ardently play through the chain-link fence whenever we visited home. I raised her in my first year alone at college. She and I were practically attached at the hip. She accompanied me throughout the six years it took to get my frickin' degree, marrying my best friend and moving across the country. I'm trying to express the depths of my love for her, and the words just fall short. Five years ago, I took up the notion that we needed to adopt a sister for her. I think this was a mildly telepathic moment, but she was eight and I figured it would be good to close out her last years with a companion. Then she started losing her fur and gaining weight. Six months after we adopted our second dog, Aria, Bella was blind. She had cataract and undiagnosed diabetes. We were told that the $6,000 surgery might not even work, and we're too poor for it anyway. She was insanely intelligent and, after a bout of depression, coped swimmingly. One day, her breath became laboured, and I knew that our time was almost up. In the two days leading up to her death, we were literally attached at the hip. I've got a lot of experience with death and knew she was terrified. I held her in my arms as she took her last breath. After she died, I immediately started looking for a puppy. I wasn't trying to replace Bella. I knew that I never could. I'd raised Bella on my own and Aria was two when we adopted her. I thought it would be good to raise a puppy together. It certainly tested my husband's patience. We adopted Lydia two and a half weeks after Bella died. She's, well, a puppy and a shepherd mixed to boot. The only way to calm her down is to wear her out. Today, while I was at work, my husband took her on a walk which made her tired. I'd just done yoga and was meditating. This is now a rarity since Lydia is always crawling on the mat, vying for attention. But today, she sidled up to me whilst I meditated. I laid down with her on the yoga mat. She was the little spoon and I the big one. Bella and I always fell asleep like this together. I was telling Lydia that I loved her and that it was nice to cuddle her like I'd done with Bella, my nickname for her. Then I talked about how much I missed Belly. As I talked to her and cuddled her, I felt the unmistakable feeling of a dog's nose nudging me on the thigh. I felt there, thinking it was Aria, but she was on the couch. 
It's nice to know that even though I can't hold her, my baby's still there. A little background. This house was built in 1995 by my dad and mom. It's a big house with two floors and a basement. We were the only family that has ever lived there. My grandmother died in the bathroom upstairs in 2010. No one else has died in that house besides her. My sister and brother who I'm going to be mentioning in the story had moved out of the house before things ever started happening. I moved out about a year ago. It started a few years after granny had died. We started hearing steps going up and down the stairs at night. We were spooked a little, but forgot about it soon because we just thought that it was Granny's ghosts, since she's the only one who's died there and we heard those steps very rarely. Maybe a year passes and I'm looking through pictures my relatives and I have sent to each other on Messenger. I found a screenshot that she had taken when we were on a video call at night and I saw some weird grey mass behind me. I zoomed in and was completely taken aback. There was a grey torso and face behind me in the darkness. I put some filters on it so I could see it better, cropped it because I had an ugly face on the picture and showed it to my family and friends ASAP. Everyone except my dad was completely shocked. My dad didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and kept denying when stuff happened. My sister said that the grey apparition looks like granny and I agreed. Anyway, a few years forward, my mum and dad are downstairs cooking something in the kitchen and I'm on the second floor in my bedroom, sitting on my bed. I hear exactly three knocks on my door. It's normal that people knock on my door first before entering, but this time no one opens the door to enter. I just stare at the door for a while and eventually ask who's there. I get no answer. I call mum on the phone because I'm spooked. She said that nobody had gone upstairs. I went on to Google about three knocks on the door and I did not like the answers I found. I panicked a bit and just waited until I felt like enough time had passed that it was safe enough to open the door. I went downstairs and told my mum and dad what had happened. Dad didn't believe me like usual, but mum was a bit spooked. By now, I've also seen shadows walk past my bedroom door. Creepy, but nothing special in my opinion. Again, a few years have passed and my mom and I have moved out. It's a long story about what happened and why we moved, but in short, domestic violence. Only my father lives in that house now. The house is empty and freezing most of the time because we live in Europe and father travels a lot due to work. It's also been put on sale. Since I moved out, the activity in the house has increased. My father has told my sister that he's been hearing someone walking around. Faucets turning on and off, doors opening, etc. He didn't believe in the paranormal before, but now he's experienced the spookiest of it himself. Yesterday, my sister, mom and I had met up at the house while father was at work, to just catch up. At one point, my sister informed me her and mom were planning on staying the night there and asked me if I was staying too. I declined because I hate that house and it makes me have panic attacks. Well, fast forward to today. Sister called me and told me that she was absolutely never going to stay in that house again because of what happened that night and I was lucky for choosing to go back home. Apparently, she had stayed up a bit late and at one point she heard someone walking downstairs fast and going into the garage. She thought it was mom up late so she wanted to go check what she was doing. To get downstairs she had to go past mom's room and when she did that she, th she saw that mom was sleeping. She was spooked. The steps were fast, so how can it be granny? She went back to her bed and couldn't sleep anymore, so she stayed up. After a while, she heard steps again, but this time in the room next to her. It may not seem scary to you because it's just some steps, but after years of thinking that it was our granny and then hearing steps that fast, I would have absolutely obliterated my pants and woken up mom to invisible sword fight the ghost away. I have always been into the paranormal as a kid. I was completely fascinated by it, and I found over the years the more open to it you are, the more downright bizarre some of the stuff you experience is. 
This tops my list of weird experiences. Roughly four years ago, my sister came to my flat one night to spend a bit of time with me, as we both had been working like crazy and hadn't had the time to catch up. It was like the two of us, and she suggested having a game of cards, something we've always done since we were kids. It's a favourite pastime in our house. Once I had gotten the cards out and started shuffling them, she asked me to look at the time on my phone, as she had worked the next morning at 7am and needed to be home for a reasonable time. She had lost her phone on a night out a few days previously, a terrible habit that she has. I told her it was about 10 past 6 in the evening. She replied, Okay, well I'll have to be getting off around half 8 or quarter to 9 to get my uniform washed and dried, so keep an eye on the time for me. I agreed and we started playing a bit of rummy to start with. Now we weren't drinking alcohol or taking any drugs. We were just having a relaxed game of cards, chatting about guys and work. The usual stuff, I suppose. Everything was normal. We played cards for what felt like two hours easy. I mean, you can't mistake that length of time when you've had about 16 to 18 hands of rummy and we're in the early stages of playing a game of poker, having got bored of the other game. I remember having the weirdest feeling come over me, like the light in the room dimmed and I distinctly felt an electrical crackly feeling start in the bottom of my spine and creep all the way up to my skull. I looked at her and she was looking at me all wide-eyed and silent, like she knew something was up. I blurted out, something is wrong, really very wrong. Without blinking or reacting in any other way, she just says to me, look at the time, which I thought was strange. I picked up my phone and looked at the time. A mixture of shock and dread creeps over me. I can't be right. It's not possible, I mumbled out loud. To myself, if anything. My phone must have glitched out or something. Getting up to turn the telly on to see what the time is on there, she's looking at me like, what the hell is going on? What is it? What's the time? She asks me again. I just repeat that it can't be right. And as I switch the telly on, the time flashes up in the corner of the screen. It said 1829. She sees it, and it's now just as freaked out as I am. Amy, that can't be right. Did your phone say the same time? I told her it did. I pull out a laptop to check the time, and even get a watch out of my drawer to see if they all matched, and sure enough, they did. We just sat there in a bit of a fog, like, what on earth has just happened? We tried to discuss it, but we couldn't make any sense of it. To be honest, it felt uncomfortable. Even to this day, to talk about it, it doesn't feel right. She breaks the silence with a joke, something like, Oh well, at least I have another couple of hours to chill with you. We just try to forget about it. I just wondered if anyone has any ideas as to what it was. Some of this is far weirder than I would like to admit. But as I go along in each post, you'll notice the serious escalation in activity. Much to my mother and sister's horror. Although I loved spooky stories, I never experienced anything myself until we moved into number 74. I swear my mother is a gypsy at heart, and we moved around a lot growing up, but this house was different. It was in the country, a small village, and the house was on a council estate. We had a row of garages behind our garden where people on the estate could park their cars with a few little secretive cubby holes and dens that were hidden by trees and thickets a kid's dream. The very end garage owned by a local creepy bloke had been vandalised. Someone had spray painted Red Rum Believer onto his garage door. I never knew what Red Rum meant back then. One warm day, about a year after moving in, we were all 11, my sister 6. A small group of us consisting of me, my sister little Jem, my best friend Gemma, next door neighbour Kiri and her cousin Michael, were hanging out in one of our dens, shaded by the trees, just mucking around as kids do, beside the vandalised garage. Michael, being a bit of a class clown, stood up doing an impression of one of our larger teachers at school. My attention was drawn to the ground where he was standing. The solid, smoothed dirt appeared to be moving like fluid. It looked like it was rippling like water. It was the strangest thing. I think it was only me that saw this. None of the others confirmed what I was witnessing anyway. What came out of my mouth next was even stranger. We need to dig there, I told them. I couldn't explain what was compelling me to say this. Something's under there. I continued, 
They all just looked at me and started asking why. I couldn't give them an answer besides we just need to have something buried there. I think boredom and looking for adventure convinced my friends and my sister to go along with me. So we found sticks. I had my sister go and pinch two spoons from our house, which was only yards away. And we began digging in silence this little circle of mud. They must have thought I was mad, but I couldn't explain it. I just knew that there was something under there. Kiri stops because she has dislodged something hard a few inches long. We scrape the dirt off with one of the spoons and can see it is a bone. One end is all sharp and jagged like it's been snapped. We look at each other a bit spooked, but decide to keep digging to look for more. It's probably an animal bone, Michael tells us, but this weird feeling had come over our little group. Finding more bones the deeper we go, we collect this little morbid pile and start digging a wider circle, but our finds start to dry up. I think there were about 15 bones, roughly. Some were a fair size, others small and broken. We gathered them up, and I remember putting them in a sandwich bag and taking them to school the following Monday. I plonked them on the teacher's desk and informed her we had found all these bones near my house. I'll always remember her face like a kid for really getting these gross bones off my desk. She told us that they were probably just animal bones and put them under her desk. I'm sure they probably went in the bin after we left that day. That's probably all they were, but I think it's curious that if I hadn't seen the ground moving like that, we would never have found them, and the fact it was next to the creep's garage didn't help. I only learned a couple of years later, Red Rum was murder backwards. A bit slow to catch on, I know, but it does make me wonder if someone knew something about him. We never heard any more about it. Little did I know, it was the start of something far more terrifying and long-lasting. As a clairvoyant, I've had my fair share of weird and wonderful encounters with spirits and entities. Most have been good, some bad, but I've only ever dealt with a few evil ones. This is a fairly long read detailing my encounters with the witch who tormented me for five years, in the most horrendous ways. I don't know how she found me or why she hated me, but will tell you the first time I ever saw her. I was dreaming I had entered into a small country pub. The ceilings were low and I had that musty smell of beer and thyme. Outside, the windows was a quiet rural lane surrounded by hedgerows, and what looked like farmer's fields beyond that. It was a lovely warm day, but the scene was eerily quiet. There were two sections to the pub, one side which was devoid of anyone, and what looked like a working bar, and the other side was closed off to the public, and looked like it was being used to store old furniture. I found myself wandering around the furniture, admiring a beautiful antique writing bureau, and I suddenly felt disorientated. My legs started to give way as my head began to spin out of nowhere. My centre of gravity was thrown out of whack and I stumbled onto the floor. And a fear I could not explain started to overcome me. I knew something was wrong and had the feeling of being circled by a predator. One I couldn't see. In a state of panic, I shuffled back on the floor until my back made contact with something solid. An old dusty chest of drawers. And I tried to calm my breathing not making any sense of why I felt like I was in so much danger. Then I heard a noise above me, a disturbing, croaky, death rattle-like sound. I was terrified, but I found myself slowly raising my head to see what was there. I couldn't help it. I shouldn't have looked, but that macabre sound drew my attention like a moth to flame. Slowly leering over the top of the drawers directly above me, a face came into view, looking down over me. It was a woman strikingly beautiful, if not cold looking. Pale blonde curls pinned on top of her head. Icy blue eyes. Young, no more than 30. But her mouth was what was the most terrifying. It was stretched open into a gaping black hole, with torn cracked flesh stretching even further, making her face a disfigured, warped, horrifying mess. The rattling coming from within that cavernous abyss. I've never felt a fear like it, the sort of which strips your brain of any normal function and sends your guts plummeting. I could barely scream. I was that scared. 
It was more like a high-pitched hysterical whimper, which barely left my mouth as her face came closer. Then I woke up sweating and still trying to scream. As disturbing as the dream was, I thought it was just that, a nightmare, although I've never been able to get her face out of my head all these years later. Roughly six weeks later, I had another nightmare in which I was involved in a vicious assault on the street outside my home. In the dream, the police came, and as I was being pinned to the ground and arrested with the assailants, I noticed a figure walking around the periphery of the circle of police and people. As my face was being pushed into the ground, it was hard to see who it was, but they were getting closer and closer to the tangle of bodies on the floor. As the police pulled me up, I saw it was a crooked old woman, bedraggled and dirty hair hanging in her face. It was full of debris and dirt. She was in an old-fashioned white nightdress. My stomach lurched, and although she looked different, I knew it was the same woman I had encountered in my nightmare weeks before. As if she sensed my realisation, she rapidly lurched forward between the police, holding me in place and sank her teeth into my arm and disappeared, leaving my arm an immediate septic mess, crawling with maggots and decaying. The pain was what woke me up. I bolted upright expecting to see teeth marks on my forearm as it throbbed and although there were none in the area, it was red as if I'd been pinched. I suspected then that these were not ordinary dreams and that she was a separate entity, not some recurring imaginary figure. I didn't know yet that she was a witch, but the more she encroached into my dreams and life, the more I physically saw snippets of hers. She had a knack for showing herself two different ways. One, the young, beautiful woman, although never again with that hideous, deformed mouth. And the other, a stereotypical hag. Every few weeks I would encounter her in my dreams, which was where I figured out she was a dreamwalker. As I called this gift, I'm not sure if that's the correct term, a spirit or entity that can manipulate someone's dreams. In another dream, she was standing by my bed. She had around my throat, slowly squeezing, until I couldn't breathe, until I woke up violently gasping for breath. I had that same experience several times. Another time on my day off, I woke up and feeling lazy, decided to lounge in bed a little longer, in and out of sleep, until I became acutely aware of someone very close to me, staring at the back of my head. I knew it was her, and everything inside me screamed, do not turn around and look at her, so I stayed still face pushed into my pillow, and then something peculiar happened. As if I was standing in the corner of my bedroom, I could see everything. Me lying in bed, covered up and face down, and hovering about two feet above my body, parallel to me, there was an opaque, brown, swirling, humanoid mass. Other times I would dream she was hovering above me, and in a half-sleeping-slash-awake state, too terrified to move. She would reach inside my chest, and I could feel an odd pressure on my heart, squeezing, causing it to beat out of rhythm. All I could do was lay there and pray that I didn't have a heart attack, as the thumping of my heart inside my chest would speed up rapidly, and then slow down, so there were seconds between each beat. I tried putting a protection boundary around my home, but it never seemed to keep her out. In the end, my spirit guide shut me down entirely to protect me from her. I guess being physically open was what kept the link going between us. The complete radio silence I had for three years was eerie to say the least, and not something I was used to as having as random spirits, popping in and out, and had been my way of life since I was 11 years old. It did the job. I didn't see her again for three years. When I became pregnant with my daughter, I unintentionally started to open up again. I only had two more experiences with her after this, although I was disheartened to know she was still linked to me. The night she showed herself again, she entered my dream as usual. I was laying in bed, and in this dream I woke and my quilt was hovering a few feet in the air above me. Through the gap in the dark between myself and the floating quilt, I could see someone shuffling around the edge of my bed back and forth. The familiar feeling of fear that came with her held me in place, scared shitless of what she was going to do next. To my absolute horror, the figure climbed underneath the hovering quilt at the foot of the bed and slowly worked its way up over my body until she was on top of me and her face in front of mine. Her hair trailed across my skin 
and she smelled of damp earth. Then she spoke, you thought I was gone. She hissed at me, and all I could do was try and scream myself awake. Suddenly, the quilt dropped back onto the bed, and I bolted up, right, finally awake. My quilt, which I usually cocooned myself inside, was stuffed down on the floor, between my bed frame and the wall, with the window that looked out onto the street. I refused to sleep at my home the next night, telling my friend I couldn't believe she was back after all this time had passed. My last encounter I ever had with her was odd to say the least, as it seemed as if she couldn't get as close to me as usual. Again in my dream, I awoke and she had me by the throat, both of us dangling in the air over my bed. Here, she was her younger self, porcelain skin, fair hair and all just staring into my soul as I struggled to breathe. I can't explain the look she had on her face. It wasn't anger, disgust. I don't know how, just the cold indifference to me with maybe a hint of defeat. I felt different, and although I woke up struggling to breathe and with a sore neck, I don't think she had actually been inside the room with me. It was the last I ever saw of her and hopefully ever will. I questioned myself early on whether it was a form of sleep paralysis, but I know that it wasn't. I've never suffered with it before or since, and that explanation just doesn't seem to fit. I suspect she was trying to stop my heart or physically scare me to death, but why? As I said, I saw glimpses of her life. I know she was a healer woman in a small community, but over time she seemed to get treated with more suspicion and hatred and shunned out of the area until she was living on the very periphery of society. Maybe once respected, then feared. I have no doubt she was immensely gifted in life, but unfortunately, she passed over with them the same gifts, fully understanding how to manipulate energy. Hands down, one of the few spirits which straight up terrified me.